Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and you can think of me as your friendly guide to the English language. Writing, history, rules, and cool stuff. Today, I have a tidbit about the two different ways we make words that end in Y plural. In case you've never noticed, it's a bit of a hodgepodge. And a quick and dirty tip about primers and primers. But first, remember, if you have access to LinkedIn Premium or lynda.com, you can watch my new video writing course free, and there's a good chance you can get lynda.com videos through your library. Just search LinkedIn Learning or lynda.com for the course called Grammar Girl's Quick and Dirty Tips for Better Writing to learn about active voice, commas, strong conclusions, and more. A member of our Facebook Grammar Girl group recently wrote in with a question about plurals. He was wondering if we knew why the plurals of some words that end with the letter Y take an S, whereas others take an I-E-S. Rich, we have an answer for you. Fortunately, in English, plurals do have some consistent rules. For example, most plurals are formed by simply adding S or E-S to the end of a word. If a noun ends with a sound that merges gracefully with the S sound, you add an S. For example, dog becomes dogs and cat becomes cats. If a noun ends with a sound that doesn't slide smoothly into an S sound, you add ES. This happens a lot with words that end in sibilant sounds, like SH, CH, X, Z, and S. For example, church becomes churches. Buzz becomes buzzes, and box becomes boxes, all with an ES on the end. A similar pattern happens with words that end in Y. If the Y comes right after a consonant or the letters Q, U, we change the Y to IES. For example, lady becomes ladies, L A D I E S. Baby becomes babies, B A B. I-E-S. And soliloquy becomes soliloquies, with an I-E-S at the end. In contrast, if the Y comes right after a vowel, we just add an S to the word to make it plural. So journey becomes journeys, J-O-U-R-N-E-Y-S. Play becomes plays, P-L-A-Y-S. And cowboy becomes cowboys with just an S at the end. An easy way to remember this is to think of that vowel before the Y. If you were to change the Y to I-E-S, you'd be piling two more vowels at the end of the word. Think how play would look if it were spelled P-L-A-I-E-S. That's a lot of vowels smashed together. One other tip. For proper nouns that end in Y, you simply add an S. You never convert the Y to I-E-S, no matter what letter comes before the Y. For example, if you had two Cadbury cream eggs, you'd have two Cadburys, spelled with B-U-R-Y-S at the end, even though there's a consonant before the Y. If you were writing about the Murray family, you'd spell it Murray's, M-U-R-R-A-Y-S. If you'd like to learn more about family names, you can go to quickanddirtytips.com and search for How to Make Family Names Plural. All this said, there are exceptions to the rules. If you're ever in doubt about a specific word, check a dictionary or a usage guide to be sure. So that's your tidbit for today. Common nouns that end in a consonant plus Y usually take an I-E-S when they become plural. Common nouns that end in a vowel plus Y usually just take an S. And when you're turning a proper noun that ends in Y into a plural, no matter what, just add S. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com or on Twitter as dragonflyedit. Before we get to primers and primers, today's episode is sponsored by Bombas. If you can't remember the last time you refreshed your sock drawer, it's probably time for an upgrade. Bombas socks are made with comfort innovations like arch support, a seamless toe, and a cushioned footbed. That's sock speak for super comfortable, and they come in hundreds of colors and styles. You'll love their new merino wool line. They're soft, warm, and naturally moisture-wicking. 
They'll keep you cool and dry on your morning run or help you stay cozy in your office's freezing air conditioning. I wear my Bombas a lot because they're so comfortable, and I feel good every time I put them on because I know that the company and I have both done something nice for someone. Because for every pair of Bombas you buy, the company donates a pair to someone in need. Bombas are what feet daydream about. Buy your Bombas at bombas.com slash grammar today and get 20% off your first purchase. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash grammar for 20% off. Bombas.com slash grammar. A couple of weeks ago when I did a show on Esperanto, I mentioned that Dr. Zamenhof wrote a primer for his new international language. And a listener named Richard wrote in to suggest that I should have pronounced that word primer. And he was right. I was not aware of the difference. I just thought primer was a kind of pretentious way of pronouncing the word. But it turns out that a primer and a primer are two different things, especially in American English. Primer with a short I and meaning an introductory book is the older word, going all the way back to the 1300s. It described both a school book and a prayer book, since at the time reading was taught from prayer books, according to Adam Online. It came from the Latin word primus, which meant first, and which doesn't sound like either modern-day pronunciation. Think of a primer as the first book you'd read on a subject, the thing that gets you started. Primer, with a long I, came from an extended meaning of that same Latin word, meaning first. In the late 1600s, people started using it to describe the first coating of paint or dye you apply to something. I've used a lot of primer in my time. And then later, in the early 1800s, people started using it to mean, among other things, something you use to set off an explosive charge, like a cap. The same root also gives us the words primary and primo, as in the slang word for first class. That is some primo chocolate cake. The Oxford English Dictionary says that primer is the original pronunciation. For reasons I couldn't find, the primer pronunciation also arose, and then the two pronunciations came to be used differently in American and British English. In American English, it's clear-cut. A primer is a school book, and a primer is the first coat of something, like the white stuff you roll onto drywall before you put on your real paint, or an explosive cap. In British English, the pronunciation that's closer to primer is usually used for all the meanings. But I am not British, so thank you to Richard for making me aware of the different pronunciations and their meanings. Finally, I have a familect story from Barry. Hey, Grammar Girl. This is Barry Bean from Peach Orchard, Missouri, and I have a familect story. Uh, when we were growing up, my brother and I both grew up on the family farm, and uh, growing up working around the farmers, we all learned to be bilingual. There was one set of uh, vocabulary and language and uh, expressions that were acceptable on the farm with the farm hands that were absolutely not acceptable around our mother or any other polite company. And uh, from time to time, we would, we would forget and we'd have to be reminded that languages belonged in their proper context. Well, when my brother was coming up, um, he uh, he had a few issues with uh, losing his temper from time to time, and he was particularly fond of some of the language that we used out on the farm. And my mother tried to help him uh, deal with some of that. So uh, one time when he came in and he had stubbed his toe or gotten stung by a bee or something and let out a string of words that, that he'd learned on the farm, she suggested that maybe he come up with a set of replacement words for uh, for that so that when he got angry or upset or hurt, he could say that instead, and that would fly in polite company. So for whatever reason, they chose minoed and fedoed. And sure enough, the next time that he got angry or hurt or whatever, he made a face and boiled up and said, minoed and fedoed. And uh, that caught on in our family, and, and in fact, even caught on with some of the guys on the farm. So now everybody knew about Minode and Fedode. And uh, fast forward years later, when we had a couple of cats who came to live at the office, we even named them Minode and Fedode in honor of uh, my brother and my mother and their made-up words for uh, for when people got angry. So uh, 
we we occasionally now still use that expression where we're having a terribly frustrating day and it can be used as in how's your day going and you just sort of boil up and make a face and go me note and be doed so uh, anyhow big fan of your podcast always enjoy it enjoy the history and uh look forward to each new one keep up the great work thank you bye-bye Thanks for sharing that cute story. It reminded me a little bit of my friend who moved to France for a year when her sons were quite young. And the youngest one, especially, who was four or five, had a hard time at school because he didn't speak the language. And he'd get really frustrated and end up in fights. So if I remember right, she told me that she told him when he got frustrated, it was fine to just swear all he wanted in English because nobody would know what he was saying and he'd feel better. So I think he didn't get in fights anymore, but he ended up swearing like a little sailor. (laughs) Anyway, if you want to share your family story like Barry did, leave a voicemail at 83-321-4-GIRL and you might hear it on the show. And finally, really finally this time, if you're wondering about the word hodgepodge that I used at the beginning of the show, it's a variation of the word hotchpotch from the late 1300s that was a kind of stew, so a bunch of things mixed together in a pot. And today it means more generally a mixture or a jumble. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. You can find me at the home of my podcast network, quickanddirtytips.com. While you're there, check out the latest episode from the Everyday Einstein podcast about which essential oils work and which don't. Thanks to my producer, Nathan Sims, and that's all. Thanks for listening. Bye.